Contrast media controversies. These are my disclosures. Three main topics today, contrast-induced acute kidney injury, benefits and harms of steroid preps, and gadolinium retention. First, contrast-induced acute kidney injury. I've labeled this a changing paradigm. There are two major papers that started us questioning the existence of CIN. Both were by Jeff Newhouse and colleagues. In 2006, he studied all the world's literature on CIN and found that only 40 of those, or 1.3%, had studied IV contrast media, and of those 40, only two had used a control group not exposed to contrast. In 2008, he followed this by looking at acute kidney injury rates in 32,000 hospitalized patients who did not get contrast and found that those AKI rates were similar to reported CIN rates. These studies did not tell us that CIN was not real. They simply made us question if it was being overdiagnosed. This led to some changes in ACR language to disentangle the causal relationship between contrast and acute kidney injury. We now have two terms. The first is post-contrast acute kidney injury. This is a generic term that's used to describe AKI occurring after contrast. But unlike CIN, PCAKI, or post-contrast acute kidney injury, is a correlative diagnosis. In other words, old CIN is now PCAKI. This is because now no cause is being attributed. There's no inherent CI or no inherent contrast-induced. Contrast-induced nephropathy, or CIN, is a specific term used to describe a sudden deterioration in renal function that's caused by the contrast material. So it's a causative diagnosis. So now when we say say CIN, we want to mean it. And so generally speaking, that's only really possible in the context of a trial in which there's a control group not exposed to contrast material. So what's happened over the last five years or so? There's now a whole slew of papers that have used propensity score matching or propensity score adjustment to control for selection bias and figure out what really is the risk of CIN. There's now around six papers by the Mayo Group which found essentially that contrast was not associated with acute kidney injury or long-term outcomes. In other words, there was no evidence of CIN. However, paradoxically, they did see that contrast administration increases the risk of dialysis in ICU patients if the EGFR was below 45. There are two papers from Michigan, which found that contrast can cause acute kidney injury, but only if the kidney function is very poor, CKD4 or 5. There are three other papers that found that contrast is not associated with acute kidney injury. These all represent IV administrations. The papers on this slide also use propensity score adjustment, but these are for intra-arterial administration. They found that contrast independently predicts post-op acute kidney injury. This group found there were no inter-agent differences in acute kidney injury or short-term harm. This paper found long-term mortality trends of low osmolality contrast material compared to isosmolality contrast material in chronic kidney disease cohorts, and this study found that contrast was not associated with acute kidney injury. So overall, if you put all these together, we have some questionable signal in the CKD 4 and 5 range, but the vast majority of patients being exposed to contrast likely are at zero or very little risk. Key point, none of these propensity-adjusted studies were able to control for prophylactic measures and propensity scoring only addresses known bias. These are not randomized trials. So you cannot interpret a negative study as CIN is a myth. However, you can interpret them to indicate that the risk of CIN is historically very much overblown, and using conventional methods, the risk of CIN can be significantly mitigated. So if you have a patient who has acute kidney injury or EGFR less than 30, what should you do? Should you give them a low-risk gadolinium contrast agent or Did you do a contrast-enhanced CT? This is my recommendation. If the EGFR is less than 30, or the patient has acute kidney injury, and contrast is deemed necessary, and the CT and MR are considered diagnostically equivalent, this is what I do. If the patient has chronic aneuric dialysis, we're going to do a contrast-enhanced CT because there's no risk of CIN. The patient's kidneys are no longer functioning. If the person's not chronic dialysis, and this is a questionable on whether they're aneuric or oliguric, we would do a group 2 agent single dose with a contrast-enhanced MR, and that is because the risk of NSF in this patient population using a single dose of a group 2 agent is extremely low. This is our policy. We avoid intravascular contrast material of the um, iodinated type when the patient has EGFR less than 30 or the patient has acute kidney injury. 
if one of these situations exists and we really do need to perform that contrast enhanced study, we'll simply pick up the phone and have a conversation about risks and benefits. It's not a hard line in the sand. What about prophylaxis? This is a randomized study published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2018 in which 5,000 high-risk adult subjects were randomized to prophylactic measures before angiography. What they found is that giving bicarbonate was no different than giving saline and that giving acetylcysteine was no different than placebo. This was true for death, renal replacement therapy, renal function decline, and CAN, or better stated, post-contrast acute kidney injury. So the message here is acetylcysteine and bicarb are really not helpful before these studies. What about volume expansion or giving intravenous volume expansion to patients who are about to get contrast? This study is a randomized study published in Lancet in 2017 of high-risk adult subjects prior to contrast, both IV and IA. They found that post-contrast acute kidney injury risk was very similar for patients getting either no prophylaxis or normal saline. This was a non-inferiority study, and non-inferiority was confirmed, meaning that these were considered to be non-inferior techniques. Additionally, when you gave patients volume expansion, they had complications from normal saline in 5.5% of patients. Usually those are related to congestive heart failure complications. So no fluid was cost savings versus saline. So really prophylaxis is not indicated if the EGFR is 30 to 59 as a general statement. So current state of CIN in radiology circles is that CIN is much less common than once believed. The vast majority of patients have little or no risk of CIN. If we decide EGFR less than 30 is going to be our screening cutoff, which is now advocated by the ACR, that would be about 2% of inpatients and about 0.2% of outpatients. We cannot conclude CIN is a myth based on these propensity-adjusted studies because the data are mixed and prophylaxis is not being accounted for. Prophylaxis is not indicated if the EGFR is above 30 and there's no acute kidney injury, at least prior to contrast-enhanced CT. This is not just a radiology issue. This is uh, editorials just written in 2018 in Intensive Care Medicine Journal, basically debating whether CIN is a real thing. Okay, switching gears to steroid preps. The reason we give steroid preps is largely based on a series of two randomized trials. This is the second one and used modern low osmolality contrast material. They randomized about 1,200 patients to get two-dose methylprednisolone 12 and 2 hours before contrast, and they found that compared to placebo, it decreased the risk of a contrast reaction. The number needed to treat to prevent a reaction of any type was 32. The number needed to treat to prevent a grade two react, grade 1 reaction was 58. But unfortunately, we didn't know a number needed to treat for grade 2 and grade 3 reactions because these were not statistically significant. There were several problems with this study. These were average risk patients, so patients who had no particular risk for having a reaction. It was designed for 6,000 patients, but they ran out of money, so it's underpowered for moderate and severe reactions. Additionally, physiologic reactions and allergic type reactions were combined, so things like vasovagal reaction and hypertension were part of their analysis. The main argument against steroid preps is that we don't really have level 1 evidence that giving preps prevents moderate and severe reactions for patients who are getting um, modern contrast media, and this is particularly true for those who are high risk for getting a contrast reaction. So we give preps to prevent allergic type reactions, and in doing so we take an uncommon event and we make it rarer, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes patients have breakthrough reactions. So the question comes up is how many patients need one prep to save one life? This is a study trying to get at the number needed to treat in high-risk patients. Ben Mervak, who's now at UNC, did a study of 1,000 subjects who had received a steroid PrEP and compared reaction rates against the literature. And in those who had a prior contrast reaction, the number needed to treat with a steroid PrEP to prevent one reaction in a high-risk patient was estimated to be about 70. And in this case, reaction refers specifically to allergic-type reactions. So high-risk patient gets contrast anyways with steroid prep, takes about 70 uh, preps to save one reaction. You can extrapolate this to reactions of more severe types, so 70 to prevent a reaction of any type, about 570 to prevent a severe reaction, and to save one life in a high-risk patient, getting steroid preps takes over 50,000 steroid preps. If you were to stack all those steroid preps up together in one big long line, that's about 80 years of cumulative prepping. So many PREPs are required to prevent one reaction, and most patients receive no personal benefit. Prepping takes a long time. These PREPs take between 12 and 13 hours, so is it worth it? This is a study of 1,400 PREPed patients and 1,400 non-PREPed patients. 
were matched by age, sex, and year of CT, and had similar rates of 13 major comorbidities. Each of the prepped patients had received a 13-hour oral premedication regimen as an inpatient. Premedicated inpatients were shown to have a delay in time to CT on median 25 hours, a longer length of stay on median 25 hours, and had significantly more hospital-acquired infections. So in general, when we do these long oral preps, it keeps people in the hospital longer, and they tend to get more infections. So does doing these long preps hurt more than they help? This study looked at this question. This is a hypothetical cohort, assuming our best evidence and best estimates of the therapeutic benefit of a PrEP and the potential harms of a PrEP. And to prevent one lethal reaction would require somewhere around 160 years of hospitalization, spending around $130 million, and contributing 500 infections and around 30 deaths related to side effects from hospital-related infections. Now, we can take this and look at just best-case scenarios, so the most therapeutic benefit of a PrEP and the least potential harm of a PrEP, and even in this best-case scenario, we're still killing three times as many people by giving steroid preps as we are saving because, unfortunately, the effect size for a steroid prep is very small. Long preps are probably harmful to vulnerable patients, so we can speed it up by giving a rapid prep. So what is the evidence base for rapid preps? Until 2017, there was only a single case series without a control group and had 10 subjects in it, but now we have some better data. This is a non-inferiority retrospective cohort study with a non-inferiority margin of 4%, testing a 5-hour IV prep versus a 13-hour oral prep. And this study found that those two prep types were non-inferior to each other. Breakthrough reaction rate was 2.5% for the 5-hour IV prep and 2.1% for the 13-hour oral prep. So in other words, it's an effective substitute in a high-risk patient. ACR has made some changes to their policy, or guidelines rather. Language says premedication may be considered, meaning that Places can make individual decisions about that. Premedication is only indicated for a prior contrast reaction to the same class of contrast. So, for example, if you prior had a reaction to a contrast-enhanced CT, you would get premedication for a future contrast-enhanced CT. If prepping, a 5-hour IV prep should be used instead of a longer oral prep for all inpatients and ED patients because those are vulnerable populations. Last topic is gadolinium retention. In 2014, CANDA noticed that patients getting multiple exposures to gadolinium-based contrast material had increasing signal intensity within the deep brain nuclei. This was correlated with how much exposure there had been. As the graph on the right shows, the more gadolinium administrations, the higher the signal ratio of the dentate nucleus to pons. The two agents that were implicated here were Magnavist and Omniscan, which are two of the three agents considered to be at highest risk of NSF in patients with poor kidney function. In 2015, McDonald investigated this further and found that the increased dentate nucleus signal intensity was linearly related to the dose of gadodiamide and the amount of actual gadolinium deposited in the brain. They were unsure what state the gadolinium was in, and the threshold for us to be able to visually detect it was four doses. So it took about four doses for us, our eyeballs to be able to see that on the screen. Here are some data from that study. We focus on the third column over, labeled dentate, the top is percent change in signal intensity on T1 weighted images. The bottom is actual gadolinium and tissue. And the x axis is how much cumulative gadodiamide that had been administered. And you can see the correlative relationship is quite strong. The more exposures to gadodiamide, the more signal intensity in the brain, and the more gadolinium and tissue. Work like this led to a statement by FDA in 2015 in which it was stated that this is happening, but we're not sure what the significance is. So pay attention to this. In 2015, this is a rat study. A series of rats got large doses of gadolinium over a five-week period, and they graphed this out. And what you can see is that the amount of gadolinium breaking away from the chelate was highest for the least stable agents. So if you break up control, one of the macrocyclics, two of the linear ionics, and on the far right, the linear non-ionic agent, this reflects what we expect to see from a stability standpoint. If we were to plot all the different gadolinium-based agents we have on the market in the United States, we have the highest risk for NSF on the top, the lowest risk for NSF on the bottom, and those which have been shown to have retention on imaging, uh, pretty much all the ones that have previously been shown to be highest risk for NSF, and all the linear ionic agents as well. Macrocyclics do not appear to be showing this on an imaging basis, but uh, laboratory work has shown that 
both macrocyclic and linear agents are having gadolinium retained in the body for a longer period of time than was originally expected. The state that the gadolinium is in is not totally clear at this time, nor is the clinical significance. These are three papers looking at clinical significance of retained gadolinium in the body. JAMA 2016, Welk et al. performed a retrospective cohort study of more than 200,000 patients all over the age of 66. In this cohort, there was no increased risk of Parkinsonism from prior gadolinium contrast exposure. 2017, McDonald presented at RSNA a prospective cohort study of 4,000 patients with a mean age of 72 years. They found no evidence of neurocognitive harm from prior gadolinium exposure. 2016, Ray et al. and JAMA performed a retrospective cohort study of 1.4 million pregnancies that could have been exposed to MRI or gadolinium-based contrast during the pregnancy. They found that there was an increased risk of inflammatory conditions and an increased risk of stillbirth and neonatal death in women who had undergone contrast-enhanced MR specifically. Unfortunately, this study was unable to control for the reason the contrast-enhanced MR was performed in the first place, which is a major confounding factor given that, generally speaking, gadolinium is contraindicated in pregnancy. So in summary, the incidence of CIN is overstated and the diagnosis is confounded. Per patient assessment is particularly hard. Unfortunately, randomized trials have been tried and failed to sort this out, and the way forward to sort this for sure is unclear. The evidence base for steroid preps is weak. It requires a very large number of steroid preps to save one life and long preps cause more harm than good in inpatients. Gadolinium is depositing in the brain following most or all linear agent injections. The FDA has been following. At the most recent update in the fall of 2018, it was stated that there was no scientific evidence of harm from this, but that package inserts were needed to be updated for all the agents, including the macrocyclics, and that handouts were now being encouraged to inform patients that this was happening. The European Medicines Agency has restricted the linear agents from their practice, and there are competing issues. Currently, FDA says linear agents are to remain on the market, but new labeling and handouts are indicated for all agents. For vulnerable patient populations, for example, pediatrics or those undergoing repeated screening like breast MR screening may require special consideration of gadolinium retention as a potential side effect. Thank you.